Check one, check one, check one. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two, check one, two. See it if you like. Check one, two, check. Thank you, Kelly. We've got a racetrack there. So, what did you hear the Lord say? Beth first, did you hear something else besides what Devin heard? Was that pretty much what you felt like in your spirit? Gotcha. Yep. Yep. Amen. In, anybody else felt like that there was something to that message that was in tongues? What did you say, Miss Karen? Yep. 
safe place. You ever wake up with a song? I bet you do. Uh, Line of Judah. I woke up two, three mornings or whatever. That's just going over my, you know, hell, hell, Line of Judah. Let the lion roar. And somehow I have this huge, I've been in huge stadiums when we have been praising the Lord and the, the volume level are just out there. I mean, I've been places where, you know, the beat of the bass will literally, your shirt will move, you know, and it's just, to me, it's that kind of roar. And then when it says, you know, that the valleys be raised up and the mountains be made low, you know, that's the Lord. There's nobody else that can do that. And then to hear something, what we heard today out of what I heard the Lord doesn't change. The Lord doesn't change. And every human being that was ever created, whether they got to live on this earth or whether they were taken away before, whether that was through abortion, miscarriage, whatever, every human being is with the Lord. And what happens is, is he calls everyone. He's made a way for everyone. And the only thing that restricts any individual or human being is the denial of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Or, <laughs> mountains be made low. <laughs> Caleb. Sometimes the only thing I think, uh, or the words kind of been circling around in my head, or whatever, diligence. Sometimes, no matter whether you're hurting, whether you're not, whether things are going good or bad, there's diligence. There's something that's stable about commitment. And the commitment, really, I, I just had this in Caleb. It, it's not really about him wanting to be with us, but there is something about being with God. And Deb and I, from the time that we, she got saved, of course, more quicker than I did, from the time I got saved and I felt the presence of God, I just want to be in the presence of God. And most of the time, when I was growing up a new Christian, or whatever, it was in the church. And my place in the church was this altar. I couldn't wait till the pastor shut up so I could get to the altar. You know, and in some cases, I didn't wait. He wasn't even through his sermon. He wasn't even finished. He might even start it or whatever. Or maybe it was because I think I told you, um, worship music spoke to me more than my pastor really did in the sermon. And I used to go to the altar and I would just lay on the floor through the whole service. And I didn't ever mean to be a distraction. 
it's just I, I knew God was going to meet me there. And I watched him start to transform my life. And I could feel the presence of God. And I needed that so desperately because I needed God to make himself real to me or I wouldn't be here today. So I've always prayed that other people would feel that. Not in the same way I did because you're different than I am. But the hunger that I had just to be in the presence of God is what I long for. He is the healer, right? <laughs> he is the healer. I mean, I think I've shared this with you, but my personal opinion about the Lord Jesus Christ, there are so many things where Scripture says what he came to do, right? I believe he came to save, heal, and deliver. Save, heal, and deliver. And how do I fit in what the Lord wants to do? Save, heal, and deliver. So I promote those things, right? Because that's what Jesus, uh, that I believe he's came to. Anybody else? I may kind of finish up on this today. Hallelujah. Well, I appreciate you. I have a passion to speak on, teach on, train on, disciple in. Things that we deal with every day. I love to talk about the future, the promises of God, everything. All those things are so awesome. But in my life, the things that have changed me is when other brothers or sisters, men of God, women of God, when they started speaking truth to me, they got in my backyard. And sometimes it was very uncomfortable. Because they were talking about things I was struggling with. And sometimes God is always, but the Holy Spirit is always convicting us of different levels. It might not, in my life, I've had several good things that I would say that the Lord said, you're going to have to leave that and move on if you want to draw near to me. I was kind of like Moses. You remember what Moses said? Lord, if you don't go with us, I'm not going. You can go in, but the Lord says, I'm not going with you. And Moses says, if you don't go, I'm not going to go. And that's kind of where my heart has been. I want to go. I want to do what God wants me to do. And when we talk about our own lives so we can deal with ourselves, it's literally a complete surrender to what God wants to do in our lives. Because if God hasn't already showed you about the things that he wants out of your life, he's going to. That plan he has is perfect for your life. And what I say by perfect, we've all had some pretty hard times. But through those hard times, it's like taking another step as he is overcome, right, in our lives. It is another step in the process that we become what we are today. Amen? Amen. The hard times has made me what I am today. And I'm nothing. <laughs> Hear this. I am nothing without Jesus Christ. I've come to that conclusion a long time ago. That no steps, no deal of, oh, look at me. Look where I am at today. So, you can look in your Bibles that maybe next week, because the Lord's been dealing with me about this, that I needed to share this, about the faithful servants. The faithful servants. And I told Deb, we got to play that last song again next week. Because it talks about God's faithfulness, and those of us that want to follow him will be faithful servants. And you know, the Bible has several places that it talks about the faithful servant, right? And what we're going to get into next week is we're not going to, it's, the money is not the important thing. It's what literally we have in our hands right now. Are we faithful with it? 
Because my Bible says if I'm not faithful with what I have, I'm probably not going to get more. And could it be that maybe because I haven't been faithful with the little, I haven't gotten the much yet? Because that's the promise, right? We get much if we're faithful with the little. This is more than it can be today. So, that might be next week. <laughs> that might be next week. I wanted to do a recap, and then there's two last things that he really dealt with. Again, this is Nate Johnston, his wife, Christy, I believe. Nate and Christy Johnson and Deb, you said they're actually from where? Australia. And he wrote this, and I believe it was on the Elijah list. Any of you that follow Steve Schultz on the Elijah list, I think he might have publicized this, or maybe this came directly from their website or whatever, their Facebook. Anyway, the heading of this, and I want to go clear back to the back and get the high points, if any of you weren't here while we did that. And his heading was, is look for the deliverance encounters as we head into 2023. Look for the deliverance encounters. Deliverance encounters. That could be God delivering us. That could be others that are around us. That we walk people through deliverance. The trials and tribulations that you have are a witness and a testimony to others who are struggling. You understand? When people see you struggle in areas, they will look at you as somebody who walks through them. How did you do that? Sometimes is the question. We went out. How many of you know Dwight and Linda Garman? Anybody? Yeah, Miss Mary does. Close friends of ours. Actually, Isaiah and Tracy, their daughter, dated for several years, whatever that was. They both ended up at ORU, and they kind of decided that maybe we'd go different directions. But I think my son, Isaiah, is their son, and I still believe that Tracy is our daughter. We have so many connections there. Dwight and Isaiah's birthday is on the same day, and Tracy and my birthday is on the same day. So we continually, happy birthdays, you know, back and forth. Yes, ma'am. Out of the ordinary. <laughs> yep, they were there, and we've met several other people who were there and a part of that. So just... As you live life, connections come and you find out that there were people in the same place you were and had experienced the same thing. Well, we had supper with them last night and went over and met them in Mankato. And when we were done, we got to talk about our buddy or whatever. They got real close with Paul Conger. And, of course, I have my deep connections with Paul. And so we talked about how we miss it and different things that way. And we were sitting there getting ready to go, and the waitress came and was giving us some water and some things that way. And the wife says to the waitress, he says, you know, he says, Kurt and I have a close friend, and every time that we would go out, he would ask the waitress two questions. And he said, would you be willing to answer for me and she said sure I'll try I don't know if I got the answer but I'll try he said there's two kind of waitresses for people the one that knows Jesus Christ and the one that doesn't know Jesus Christ but would like to and he says would you do me the favor by answering that and you could see in her face yes I know so it was good to kind of bring back those things and Dwight was faithful to ask maybe a complete stranger of himself. Do you know Jesus? You can today. And so many times we just rush by. And, you know, Paul, I can remember, Paul was always a giver, a tremendous giver. And he'd walk in and some waitress would walk in and he'd just hand him $200, you know. And by the same token, 
there would be times where he would feel like the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart. He was supposed to pull in, go to this restaurant. He didn't know other than he knew they served good chocolate ice cream. So he'd go in and have him some ice cream, and he'd sit there, and all of a sudden he would look over, and he'd make eye contact with some fellow or whatever. And Paul's always, he would always be in the spirit and going, Lord, is this the person that you want me to talk to? Is this whatever? So he's finishing his ice cream, and all of a sudden, this guy got up and came over, and he says, I don't, well, if you remember Paul, Paul's a pretty big fella, you can't miss Paul. Long hair, we always thought he had this straggly beard, you know, he's only got a few whiskers that are here, and they're kind of spiked out all over, kind of like mine was, and my wife told me I needed to shave it off because it was curling up. So. Anyway, Paul was just sitting there, and the guy came over and talked to him, and he said, what do you do? The guy asked Paul, what do you do? He says, well, I'm a traveling with evangelists because I've been to so many countries and did whatever, but he said, I preached the gospel. And the guy says, well, all I know is I was supposed to come in this restaurant and when I came into this restaurant, it said that there's going to be some guy that's there and God says, I'll show you which one it is and you're to go over to him and he gave him $20,000. Now again, do you think it's important to listen to the Holy Spirit? What did Paul do? He put it in the ministry and that minister to others and carried the gospel out, right? So listen to what God is saying. So we're looking for deliver deliverance encounters in 2023. The first one that we uh, had talked about was the deliverance of the shell shock syndrome. And I tried to relate to you what he says here. A lot of um, military people have gone through shell shock, and it actually came through in World War II or whatever. And it's, it, it is the post-traumatic stress disorder. It's the intensity of being bombardment and fighting. And what happens is if you fight this, some of the... Uh, what I say, things that start to surface if you fight that. What manifestations of this? Yeah, would be. Uh, uh, let me see here where, where it's at. They, it produces helplessness, panic, and the inability to reason. It affects your sleep, your walk, and your talk. In short, the traumatic, uh, it's trauma, it's stress, and it's fatigue of long sessions of combat. It's fatigue. And who's the author of all of that? The author is the enemy who likes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's running you through the ringer. And it kind of gets to that point of enough's enough that Deb shared earlier. But the enough enough is, God said it was enough a long time ago, and he really asked us, how long are you going to put it up with? Right? So being shell-shocked, this, and this is what, uh, so, you know, if we find symptoms or whatever, it says many that are shell-shocked, with, with it comes the inability to function in any way that they used to. And they have struggled to dream, pray, and even hope and expectation for anything ahead when you have battled this and been through that kind of combat. So if you're finding yourself to experience any of these symptoms of the battle fatigue to any degree, God wants us, wants to remove the shock and damage done to you emotionally, mentally, as well as bringing healing to your physical body. And if you remember, we prayed for that. We prayed that God would set us free and deliver us from the shell shock syndrome. The next thing that we dealt with was the deliverance of crippling disappointment. And all of us have had disappointment in our lives. And 
to this point, or whatever, there are so many people who have had face masks. Uh, get my words right here. We have had uh, disappointment knocks us back. It wants to discourage you and and keep you from the mission and the plan and the purpose that God has. Distract you. Um, but God is trying to say to us that he is healing many right now, but now, but he's also revealing the why. Why the disappointment? Why did you walk through that? Why did you have to go through that? Says we have a mag magnificent race set before us. Now you kind of have to believe that in your spirit that I truly do have a magnificent race that God has set before me. And can I not know that this is the enemy that's trying to knock me out, take me out? So it's through the the enemy has tried to rob us in this season by derailing many from their purpose through the deep wounds of dis disappointment. These wounds have been so deep for many that it has been difficult to imagine life beyond it. In fact, many are in a place of looking back over this last year and saying, I can't even imagine that this would be like this from last year. It uh, wasn't in my mind that we would be here this a year ago. <clears throat> so we were able to pray, and many who have come in hopelessness or whatever, I believe that this is the kind of deliverance we're going to see. That's a simple cry to the Lord. Lord, you've seen what I went through. I'm tired of it. I am not letting the enemy carry this any further. The next one was the breaking of bitterness and stepping into the new clothes of the new year and the new air. So what was it here? It was, if you remember the dream, he had a dream where there was some sort of chemical warfare and people were running around that had this black slime all over. And a person, as they were running the street, screaming, you know, in my mind, I had to, if you ever hear or some of the old stories about hard and feathered, only without feathers, that it's just like a black slime of tar that was just coating people or whatever. And that's what he was seeing. And they were running the street, screaming, asking for help. And he said a guy jerked him off of the side street and jerked him into the building. And he heard this word. Or whatever you have to take the old clothes off to be set free and healed you have to take the old clothes off you can't keep wearing these clothes these clothes are literally killing you and this is part of the transformation God's doing in all of us you got to be willing to take the old clothes off the old clothes sometimes the old clothes are friends Sometimes you got to take the old friends off because the old friends are going to lead you down a hole that you can't get out of, right? Those are hard decisions, but God says you got to take the old clothes off and then you got to trust Him with the new clothes. Amen? So He just said the black, slimy substance. Many were running around screaming, unable to get the slime off, and it was on me too. It said. Then someone in the street pulled me into a door of a building and said to me, the old clothes must come off. I felt vulnerable, and then I was naked, but I knew it was the only way to remove the slime. The straight way, I, uh, then straight away, I looked and I saw I was wearing new, clean clothes. So even if you go back to Adam and Eve, and they tried to fix themselves after they had sinned, and they were hiding, they were embarrassed, they were naked before God, and they even said, we're naked, and God said, who told you? Right? 
there was a confrontation between good and evil. And then he went and killed the goats or sheep or whatever he did. But he got leather and he clothed them and he covered it. The clothes are clean. And God knows what he's doing. But you have to be willing to take the old clothes off. The next one I think that we dealt with was the fact that we were talking about, I, I got this vision of uh, marionettes or puppets that had the strings attached to them. And the strings are all always made, if it's the enemy, to bind you, to uh, make you act how they want to. So there is manipulation and control and we know from experience that manipulation and control is witchcraft, right? So the devil himself likes to hook you up and bind you with rope to make you act as he wants you to act. Do the things that he wants you to do. I don't care whether you're a Christian or not. Um, some people, maybe even our own denomination, they struggle with people and you cannot be possessed if you know Jesus Christ. Possessed or oppressed or whatever. I've just seen some things that don't quite go with some people's theology. I've known some good people that had a lot of struggle. And the freedom came only through one. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. So one of the things that we had did that week was, is this was a declaration, and you can read after me again. I, I mean, we say after me again, devil, those strings have been cut. I'm no longer under your agenda. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Then last week, we talked about removing the arrows out of our back. And I felt like the Lord kind of orchestrated that. A lot of times we think that we come forward and the pastor's going to pray for us. Everything's going to be all right. But I knew that the Lord wanted those who felt like that they still had arrows in their back to come forward. And that those of us that were standing beside each other. It's a little bit, I was trying to put out the focus of what Caleb's been saying about family. That it's your brother, your sister has deep care and concern. And it's not about one man that has the anointing to do it and nobody else. I've tried to break that ever since I've been saved. That I'm all about a body ministry, not a person ministry. You understand that? Because... The power is not sometimes, even in the words that we say, there are some people that are really, what's the right word, elo eloquent speakers and can say all the right words, but there is no anointing, no power to carry out the plan of God. A little simple word in his name is Jesus has the power. The blood of Jesus cannot be stopped and cannot be tolerated. All right? So last week, we had people come forward, and I believe all of us basically come forward. All of us prayed for one another. And we didn't stop with just pulling the arrows out, because what we were talking about the arrows last week was they're so vital because you can even put on the whole armor of God, have the breastplate on, but you're very vulnerable in your back. Where do arrows come from in your back when you have the full armor of God? doesn't come from the enemy from the front. Does it? it could be a brother or a sister that has always said, I have your back, and before you know it, they have criticized, they have belittled, they have accused, right? And you never understood why that arrow came, right? Right? It's still the enemy. And when we allow the enemy to get a foothold, that's why we fight this battle. That's why you never turn and run away from the enemy. 
you always take your stand, have your full armor on, and you're ready, sword in hand, because that foe is literally defeated. But when he can create fear and get you to run, you're vulnerable to him. And he will use even good people in their lives. Right? And so those wounds are pretty deep. And so it wasn't just enough that we pulled the arrows out. We needed to pray that the healing balm of Gilead, the healer, was going to come and heal those wounds over so that we can move forward. Because a lot of times when you have arrows in your back and you remain there, you can't move forward. Your purpose in God, you can't do that. Why? Because we talked about a lot of times when that happens and as a brother or sister, you become a closed book. You you go, I'm not sure if there's anybody out there I can trust in. Right? Am I speaking to somebody there? Have you ever had to do? I'm not sure. Sometimes I don't even know if I can trust my own wife. <laughs> I'm just trying to speak here. <laughs> Hypothetical. Thank you, BJ. I just, maybe I got out of the doghouse there. I don't know. We all say words that we wish we wouldn't have said, right? We make mistakes. Mark. Such a nice fella. And pretty soon you look like Dr. Hook, right? You don't have a hand no more. Yeah. I've had some of those. I've even had dogs that are that way. Seem like they're really getting friendly to you. They're rubbing up on you and you're petting them like that. And I had a German Shepherd one time that none of us kids used to ride a bike down that street because that dog knocked you off the bike. Well, we were standing there, and the old boy was outside. He was an alcoholic, and we talked to him, and, and uh, I think his name was King, the dog. And old King come out there, and, man, we were just trembling in our boots, you know. And he goes, oh, he's not a bad dog or whatever. And said, yeah, he's not a bad dog. You've never been off your, knocked off your bike by him either, buddy. Anyway, we were sitting there, and he came up and was petting him. And the buddy of mine that was with me on the other bike, he was just patting him away, and we thought everything was cool. About that time, the king grabbed a hold of his arm. Right there, he didn't bite down, but he wouldn't let him go. He was just holding him. When he didn't puncture the skin or anything. He just let him know, I got you. You're not going anywhere. You know, and finally, uh, Wilbur, Wilbur Slonsky came over. He said, King, King Punk, let go. So I know how that works. So let me finish. We've got a couple minutes here, and I'll try to finish this through. One of the last ones he had was the deliverance of long-term trauma and childhood wounds. Long-term trauma and childhood or childhood wounds. And some of us have had tremendous hurt. And some of us, we've had, in my case, stupid things I've done that I can't blame on anyone else. But sometimes there's trauma that is there, right? And what happens is when you have trauma like that, you always want to blame those who maybe caused the, tra the trauma. And you're stuck. You're stuck until you can let them go. You understand? And, and when we did, like, uh, deliverance from bitterness, that's one of them. If you're bitter enough and you say, well, they're going to get there someday, and, you know, God's not a just God unless he deals with them. And blah, 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 blah. I know you never have said that, but <clears throat> when you have trauma and you have such deep hurt, sometimes we all have triggers, and I've 
told me some of my triggers or whatever that it just pops and then you react in certain ways and my certain ways when my trauma had hit or whatever I reacted in, in ways that were not God so that's a part of my growth that's a part of my maturity is get on top of that you hear what I'm saying you got to get on top of that how do you do that you surrender God I have such, such hurt such pain here and my arrows hurt so bad you know I, I don't know what to do and and so anyway, it says, Jesus, he, he, this is Nate here talking, he said, Jesus did such a miraculous work in setting me free of some of the very deep wounds from my childhood. This is him talking. So again, he has personal experiences. That looked impossible to remove. They had become monuments. Now that would be a mountain that needs to be made low. Right? There's a monument that keeps there. Sometimes we run our head and we go around this thing, around this thing, around this thing, and God says, no, I want to knock it down. I want it done. And this is monuments in my life affecting my identity, my relationships, and my destiny to the point that I was like a walking leper, unable to ever enter into or experience the new life Jesus wanted me to have. Those monuments can be so big that it will restrict you from your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can confess him, you can talk, you can pray, but that monument is like banging your head against solid iron, and it's immovable, right? Looks impossible. He said, I had a dream that I was a young child living in a western slum. What does that look like to you? A western slum. To me, I was thinking of India. You remember Calcutta? Just filth and slop and just living in the worst kind of conditions you could ever live in. And this child is living in this slum. He says, uh, and having to constantly run and hide from the people, including neighbors and my parents. Constantly running and hiding from my neighbors and my parents just to stay safe and protected. He said the environment was so chaotic and dysfunctional that it took me a while to stop crying as I woke up from this dream. I felt the pain of this child so deeply and the lonesome journey of basically missing out on my childhood, a supportive family, and the fundamentals of a healthy upbringing. I knew this child represented those who have lived horrific memories back to their childhood, back in their childhood, and God is dealing with minutes, many of them at once and for all. And he says, as someone who carried memories for a very long time, let me say that Jesus is the only one who can heal these type of wounds and the only one who can bring healing to trauma and memories from long ago. And again, this is the scripture that I used a while back, but he, he said, you know, most people would say we're scripture for that. So this was the Psalm 103. Deb read it out of the, the uh, Passion Bible, the day that we did it before, but I'm going to read it here. It says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost beings, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all the benefits who forgives and who all the benefits and who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you 
with love and compassion who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Amen. And see, that's a willingness to be able to receive that word because that's the promise of God no matter what we've been through. Amen? Amen. So, that trauma has been there. And we take authority over that trauma and every painful driveway, every spirit that is not of God that continually makes that way has to go in the name of Jesus. And this is the last one. It's called Marker Encounters Crossing Into the New Year. So the greatest tragedy of these wounds pain is that they can rob us from our intimacy and connection with God that we are designed for. In a dream last week he said he had a dream that one of the generals in the kingdom had come to him and handed him a multi-colored pack of sharpie permanent markers. A general in the kingdom, somebody that he appreciates and is fighting for the kingdom of God, came to him and handed him a pack of multicolored sharpies, permanent markers. And the general said to him, Get ready, this is going to change your life. Get ready, this is going to change your life. He said, When he woke up, he said, The core of the message of the dream bubbled up from the spirit. He said, God has marker encounters coming to us in the next few weeks that will bring healing and restoration. But they will also be encounters that marks us for life and launch us out into the new year. Amen? Are you looking for those encounters? I'm looking for those encounters. And God's going to bring those encounters to us. They are going to be markers, not only that you can mark for your healing and restoration, but also markers that are going to give you direction and purpose for the next year. So let me read this, and then at the end, I'll, I'll ask you if you would like to stand and we'll pray together. So whatever you've been facing, this is his summary, whatever you've been facing, whatever demonic forces have been trying to keep you bound, whatever deep wound and trauma that you've been carrying, whatever betrayal you have been, you have been trying to be free from, the past memories and the string, the disappointment or bitterness that you have been dealing with. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word over you today. Listen to that. The blood of Jesus speaks a better word over you than everything that has happened to you. Do you understand that? The blood of Jesus is a better word spoken over you than anything that's happened. It's time to come into 100% freedom. So you are clutter-free and whole. Amen? Amen. Butter free and whole. And it's only by the blood of Jesus that speaks a better word. Amen. The blood of Jesus is greater than anything the devil can throw at us. Right? When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises a standard. Doesn't he? What's the standard? The blood of Jesus. The enemy can't go there. Amen. Again, let me tell you this. The enemy can only do what you let him do. What you tolerate, what you tolerate is what he will do. If you stop him because you're a child of God, the blood of Jesus, he can't cross that line. Amen? You can't cast out demons that you want to play with. Do you understand what I'm getting by that? 
my experience again. You can't cast out a demon. No matter how bad it's hurt you, no matter how bad it's destroyed you, and no matter how much fear it's created, if I get rid of this demon, then I won't have any power. That's a lie. And he is the father of lies. Right? If you would, stand with me. We're going to pray this prayer. And get out of here. I'm sorry for keeping you long. We'll be finished up with this. Repeat after me. Pray with me, please. Holy Spirit, cleanse me. Heal me. Restore me. Renew me. And encounter me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Do you get that? To cleanse me, to heal me, to restore me, to renew me, to encounter me. So we're going to ask the Holy Spirit just to come and encounter us. Set us free. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we thank you so much for sending your Son to us that paid the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, the death on the cross and has been raised again who sits at the right hand of the Father right now interceding for each and every one of us. Thank you, Father, for sending the Holy Spirit that when Jesus left us, the Spirit of the living God came to live and dwell within us, that we have the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living and dwelling in us. And Lord, with the Holy Spirit within us, there is nothing that is impossible with you. Lord, we just lift our hands and we cry out to you. I want to be, I want to say, and I want to continue to do everything that you have called me to do. I want to carry out the, the, the will and the passion and the purpose of Jesus Christ in my life. So Lord, I stand humbly in your name. And we simply ask those simple words. Come, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, do more than I could ever ask, think, or even imagine as what your word says. Create in us the very things that people would see the light of this world within us, that they would be drawn to the very Spirit of God in us, that they would look for someone to rescue them as you have rescued us. Father, I pray for transformation, that we would simply surrender and lay everything down. We give you glory, we give you praise, because it's all about you working in our lives. We open our hearts and our spirits to you, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. Um, I'm not sure. Can can I send her an email? Beth was wanting a copy of that. I don't know whether you want to copy these or whether you want to email that. There you go. All right.